Anderson Trust versus Joel Stokes, Sandra Stokes, trustee of the Jimmy Jack Irrevocable Trust. Council feel, and parties feel, council feel free to make your appearances, please. Uh, Joe Coppage, here for Ms. Tobin. Uh, President, please, uh, Ms. Tobin. Uh, I appreciate it. Good morning, Your Honor. Just calling for the Honor. Um, I didn't see findings fact, proposed findings fact conclusions of law. When we left yesterday, you'd completed your opening statements, and so plaintiff's counsel, feel free to call your, well, subject to the ruling of the court, which of course was reaffirmed yesterday for all the reasons stated, given the totality of the conduct and how the parties have proceeded in this case. Um, each of the parties, because they would have been fully noticed initially in Rule 16, there is no surprise, there is no hardship or anything that's been demonstrated that parties um, should be provided an opportunity to appear. So I think I was going to tell plaintiff's counsel that they could proceed, but I think defense counsel, excuse me, counterclaimant's counsel wants to state something first. Yes, Your Honor. But it's not your turn yet. No. Because it's their case in chief. So unless they agree, they get to move forward with their case in chief, and then you can address anything after their case in chief, and I can address it at that juncture. Well, it, it's a housekeeping matter on a uh, what we addressed yesterday on a motion for directed verdict. Uh, right, but I'm not going to address anything. This court always has discretion to hear things at different times. I told you all yet, as you left yesterday that plaintiff was going to have an opportunity to put trustee on if he chose to do so pursuant to the court's order. I need to let that happen first. Okay? Oh, oh, oh. I appreciate it. No. Thank you so much. Okay. If you wish to call the trustees, the then you may do so. The court's not requiring you to call anyone. It's up to you. The counterclaimant call is Ms. Tobin, Your Honor. Okay. Trustee. Feel free to go to the bench and Madam Clerk will swear you in. Council, I'm seeing documents and a whole bunch of things. Those cannot be utilized, as you know. You can't. Those are not exhibits. You can't use those things. It's just testimony today. Appreciate this. Thank you so much. Madam Clerk, feel free to swear in the witness. Yes, Your Honor. Please remain standing and please raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God. Thank you. Please be seated. And could you please state and spell your name for the record? <clears throat> Nona Tobin, N O N A T O B I N. Thank you. <coughs> Feel free to proceed. Ms. And Tobin? I believe Marshall, is there water on the witness stand? There should be. She has water. Thank oh, you. okay. Thank you so much. Feel free to proceed. Ms. Tobin, where do you live? I live at 266 or Olivia Heights Avenue, Henderson. And that's in what? Uh, uh, subdivision. Sun City Anthem. How long have you lived there? Since February 20, 2004. Would you describe for the court briefly your educational background and also maybe your professional background? Um, I have a master's degree and I have postgraduate certification in municipal management. And I've, uh, I've run the civil service for the city of San Jose and, and done a number of things related to um, the issues of this trial, to process, handling of uh, official records, access to records, and so forth. Did you know a, a Gordon Hanson, Ms. Tobin? Yes. He, um, he was my fiancé. Um, he lived with me at um, my property since uh, from 2007 until he passed away. Um, in uh, January 14, 2012. Did, um, are you familiar with the property at issue in this case, which is located at 2763 White Sage Drive, Henderson, Nevada? I am more familiar with that property than anybody in the world. I have been dealing with it for seven and a half years since he died in ex extreme um, circumstances. I've had to look at every single record related to that property. So 
so I'm very familiar with it. Can you describe for the court briefly the ownership history of the property? Okay, it was built and uh, he and his wife moved in um, in 2003 in July and they um, got divorced. She quit claim the property to him in 2004 and at that time he as an individual took out the Western Swift deed of trust the July uh, 14 deed of trust that is the, dis the disputed deed of trust in this case. Um, so he had it in 2004 and then in 2008, August 22nd, 2008, he formed a, a trust um, for testamentary trust and the property was deeded to the trust on August 27, 2008, and the trust owned it until the title was changed um, on August 22nd of uh, 14, and when, when that was the foreclosure deed that was recorded. Then after that, subsequently, um, I, I became the successor trustee, and so the uh, property, when he died, so then the property, <coughs> that property was the only uh, asset in the trust, it was underwater. That asset I um, deeded to myself as an, as an individual in 2017. Uh, because of the uh, <coughs> uh, the trust had no other assets and the cost of administration was unnecessary and the closed the trust. And so that, the title since 2017 had been in my name. After, one, one, I just missed one, like in the, after the... Um, Council, the question was, are you familiar with the property? Sorry. So you can appreciate narratives. I mean, I, I'm giving a lot of leniency because it's a bench trial, but you need to go question to question, right? I understand, Your Honor. Thank you. Let me ask Ms. Tobin, was, was the trust ever amended? Excuse me? Was the trust ever amended? Yes, it was amended on August 10th of 2011, and the sole purpose of the amendment was to change the beneficiaries. It did not change me as the trustee. Were, were you one of the one of the original trustees? So, Gordon Hansen was the um, trustee. I was the successor trustee upon his death. I was a co-beneficiary with his son. Um, the amendment made it a fifty percent. Once you became a a trustee of the trust. What did you do with the property? I, I, well, he had passed away and the market had crashed. If the house was underwater, I put the property up for a short sale, listed it with um, the Proudfit Realty to sell it. How that long? February 20th of 14th. How long have you been a, a homeowner in uh, Sun City, Anthony? <coughs> said. So it's 15 years now. As a as a homeowner in Sun City, Anthony, are you familiar with the HOA assessments? Yeah, I, I've uh, paid my assessments every time. I've had one late fee required in the 15 years, and that was... August 17th of 12, which is the, an issue in this case. It, it, in your complaint, there's a reference, in your counterclaim, there's a reference to uh, hand delivering um, a check, check number 143, uh, to pay the HOA dues for uh, the Hanson uh, property. And then later there was an issue with regard to when that was, when that was actually, actually paid. 
Can you address that for the court, please? Right. I. The, that was the only time my personal um, assessments were late. And so when I went and picked up the checks from the bank for, to, for this account, and I saw that my check had been stamped received on the date, August 17th, 12, that it had been uh, written. And the um, check, so 142 was for my house, 143 was for Bruce's house, and that uh, second check had no date received, and it just had, the bank said that it was uh, credited to the account in uh, Objection, Your Honor. That's hearsay. Sustained. But can't take into account what the bank said. I understand, Your Honor. You said Bruce. Uh, just, just clarify for the record. Uh, who is who is Bruce? Uh, Gordon Bruce Hanson. They call him Bruce. Was he known by Bruce? Yes. So if we call him Bruce, is that okay today? Yeah. Let me back up. Um, back in 2012, how much were the the assessments, the HOA assessments? Two hundred and seventy-five dollars a quarter. Was there a late fee associated with that payment? Right. There was a, the uh, delinquent assessment policy said that after thirty days past due, that the fine of uh, twenty-five dollars could be added as a late fee. So we we touched on, and I don't think you clarified that, but we touched on how you try to pay make the payment. Which quarter was that payment for? The quarter ending September 30th of 12th. When was it due then? Uh, July 1st. So when would the, the late fee kick in? July 31st. Now, when did you make the payment for Mr. Han for the Hanson Trust property? Uh, for that? Go ahead. Yeah, it turns out that I was wrong. Uh, it was actually, I sent it in on um, October 3rd or 12th with a, a letter telling him that it was late. What was the purpose of sending the letter? It Well, to say, here's $275 for the quarter plus the $25 late fee. And here's the notice of uh, the owner's death. And here's the notice that the property's been sold and that uh, the future assessments can come out of the escrow. A couple of things there. Were there any other enclosures besides the check and the notice of Mr. Uh, Bruce's death? No. You mentioned that the property had sold. Can you describe that for the court? Okay, there was a purchase offer from the Sparkmans on August 8th that I accepted on August 10th with the provision that the um, seller's of the, the seller's cost would be the lender's cost. Because it was underwater and the bank you know, I said, okay. Did, did the sale of the Sparkmans, did it go through? No. It, I, the people moved in, but the bank did so many, so many things that they didn't uh, accept it. They didn't give lender approval. And finally, on April 4th of 13, the Sparkman said that they had it. and. They wanted their money back, and they, and then they moved out. April 30th, I, I think. Of what year? 2013. But it had been in escrow for like six months. Once you paid the quarterly dues that were due in July of 2012, I assume you paid them in October, is that correct? Yes. Once you paid those in October, over. And what amount did you pay? A three hundred dollar check for HOEUs. Once you made that payment, were there any additional sums doing owing to that point to the HOA? No. 
was the payment credited properly? No. Can you describe why not? I don't know why, but I know that in the records, that, and a lot of this stuff that I learned by looking at this in great detail later, because at the time I was getting it. But they, they put these kind of fees, like a management collection fee, or a, a, I don't know, there's just all kinds of fees related to collections. And there was no need for collections, and there, there just was no, no need. And there's no authority to add those kinds of fees without giving some kind of notice. You mentioned that as a longtime property owner at, at Sun City Anthem, are there notice requirements for violations? They're very explicit. And what, what do those entail? Okay, the, the um, CCNRs um, 7.4 are require that before the board can. Um, yeah, I'm going to check this to your city because that's uh, relying on documents that are not admitted, but it's for the truth of the matter. So they are admitted. I, I think those documents are admitted in this case, Your Honor. They've, they've been admitted in the case. Are they admitted to counsel? There's no documents admitted for this trial, right? There's no exhibits right. because you all did not come understand. Right. So, here's the objection. The court's inclined to grant us a hearsay objection because saying what the document is saying for the truth of the matter asserted. Is there anything else the court should be considering? I have a question. You can't. Um, no, Your Honor, other, other than the fact that, that those documents were introduced in this case and have been admitted in other matters, so I understand. They've not been admitted. I don't know what you mean by the term admitted. To ex they were submitted to the court in, 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 in various court filings in this case, right, in part of the pleadings. As you can appreciate, for purposes of trial, you don't say, go fish, find somewhere in some pleading that something may or may not have been attached and get to use it for purposes of trial. There's no trial exhibit that has been admitted I have to sustain the hearsay objection because what's being stated is being based on what's saying is a document which is not admitted for trial purposes. Understood, Your Honor. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Ms. Tobin, have you ever received any violation notices yourself? Uh, they've come to Gordon Hanson at my property, but I've never had one from my property. And the one that I got from uh, was related to a notice that there would be a hearing for the violation of dead trees and a fine of $25. And I received a notice of sanction on August 13 of 14 that said that $25 would be accumulating uh, each week that the dead tree wasn't replaced. Did you receive the September 20, 2012 notice of hearing to suspend membership benefits for delinquent assessments from Sun City Anthem? The one that was they claim was attached to your October 3 letter. Did you receive that? No. Were you provided with a copy of the September 17, 2012 Notice of Intent to Lean? I, it, I'm, I'm confused because of the way the evidence, I mean, I know these things from later, but I don't know it from later. At that time, did you get one at that time on or about September 17, 2012? No. Have you since seen that notice? Yes. Have you reviewed the Sun City Anthem disclosures in this case? In considerable detail. Was there a proof of service for the September 17, 2012 notice of intent to lean? No. Have you, and you said you've since reviewed that notice, right? Yes. 
was it accurate? It was not authorized. I mean, no. those keys. Uh, objection, Your Honor, again. It's a uh, hearsay. It's, off of, uh, it's based on a document not admitted into this evidence, and it's off of the truth of the matter asserted. Okay. Um, you hear counsel's response because the I'm not sure about with... what it says, Your Honor. Okay. I guess that my next question, I don't think. I... My, my next question was going to be, was it accurate? And she said it wasn't authorized. I was going to ask why it was not accurate. So that may be a, the, the first question. I don't think it was somebody was in court calling for hearsay. Overrule okay. the, the objection for the basis stated because the question was asked whether it was accurate or not. So let me go into the truth of the matter, sir. It's a perception opinion of a lay witness, which would be acceptable. Okay. Okay, I understand. I asked if it was if it was accurate, and yeah. why not, Ms. Tobin? Because the the fees that were put in there. Let me hear the end of the answer, and then the court can determine whether or not I can sure. take it into account. Was that the end of the answer? Kind of. Or, I think she was cut off your honor, I believe. Okay. They were extraordinary. They were like, when $300 is actually due and it's 617 asked for, it's extraordinary. Now, let's, I don't understand. So the objection was hearsay? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. It's for the the court's order. only going to take that statement into account to the extent it's the opinion of a lay, it's a lay opinion not as to the truth or accuracy of the underlying amounts, because the underlying amounts would be the hearsay portion. Okay, please continue. Ms. Tobin, did you object to the fees that were contained in the September 17, 2012 notice of intent to lien? I didn't get it. Did you appeal uh, to the board within 30 days? Of what? I mean, I didn't get it. Have you had a chance, have you reviewed the December 14, 2012 Notice of Delinquent Assessments? Yeah. Was that notice accurate? Oh. As of December 14, 2012, what was the maximum amount, maximum amount of delinquency for the property's HOA account? It, it was the... $275 Are you aware of any tenders in this matter uh, to pay the, what's been called the super priority amount? I am from reviewing the disclosure. But I didn't know at the time. Let me ask, were, were you ever giving notice that any of the lenders had made a tender to pay the super priority amount? No. Did you receive a notice of foreclosure sale dated February 12, 2014 for this property? Yes. How much was claimed to be due and owing in the notice of sale? $5,081.25. When was the scale sale scheduled? March 7th. I didn't hear anything, so he's moved on. Pardon? The objection was as to hear says to the underlying amount being stated pursuant to this notice because again that's a document item that it is on. She, uh, the witness testified. If she's reviewed a public document and of her own knowledge or has knowledge of the amount that's in the, the notice of sale, 
That's of her own knowledge. She can testify to that. The court's going to overrule the objection based on the way the question was asked, based on the answer, and based on the timing of the objection. Three independent graphs. Go ahead. When was the sale scheduled? March 7, 2014, depending on. Let me back up. Was, was the amount correct in no. the notice? Why not? It, because it was adding all of these fees. It was not correct. Let me ask, are you familiar with um, uh, NRS 116.31162 uh, 4? Yes. Did you receive a, a schedule of the fees that may be charged for unpaid HOA obligations? No. Did you receive a proposed repayment plan as required by the statute? No. Did you receive a, a notice of right to contest the past due obligation at a hearing before the exec executive board? No. Did anyone provide you with the procedures for requesting such a hearing? No. When you received the the notice of foreclosure sale, what did you do at that point in time? I um, gave it to um, Craig Lighty, who was um, who was becoming the uh, listing agent. I had the the property had been off the market for a number of months because Bank of America had taken possession, but not taken the title. Other than the notice of foreclosure sale, did you receive any other notices prior to the sale? None. At some point, did you contact the ombudsman in this matter? Yes, a number of times. Who is the ombudsman? Well, the ombudsman's office is uh, it's the ombudsman for common interest communities, and um, they are a body that um, that handles the issues in HOAs. Basically, they maintain by the statute. The statute requires that they maintain certain types of records about the HOAs, and they collect money from the HOAs to provide this. They serve as a um, uh, administrative entree into the mediation process. Let me back up for just one moment. Um, you said the sale did not take place. Luke said March 7th when it was first scheduled. Is that correct? Correct. Do you know when the sale did take place? Uh, August 15th. What year? Did you contact the ombudsman before or after the actual foreclosure sale? After. And what was the purpose of contacting the ombudsman? Well, that, that first time it was because the I I couldn't believe that it happened that it had been sold. I, was, I, I mean, I had a, an offer on the table for, for five times the amount they said they sold it for. Nobody told me that it was happening, and so I, I checked the county records, um, and it hadn't been entered into the assessor's record, and then I looked up, and I found out that, you know, I, that uh, there's supposed to be a deed there and um, I was checking because I had already gone through six months of having the title and being locked out and I couldn't just take the liability if it's sold in that kind of unconventional manner and I 
I still had the title. I couldn't figure it out. And the ombudsman said, Objections to your CEO. Court's not going to be able to hear what the ombudsman reportedly said or didn't say. Well, what I asked was, is there a deed? And there was no deed. Did you make a, a public records request of the ombudsman? I've made a lot of them. What was the purpose of doing that? Um, because I wanted to see all of the uh, records that were related to this foreclosure that the ombudsman is required to keep. Because I, I couldn't believe it. And so when, when, uh, um, yeah, so I got those records and I found out like a lot of things about the, the manner that the sale was conducted was inappropriate. Did, did the ombudsman provide you with business records in response to your public records request? Oh, yes. yes. Have you reviewed those records? Yes. In reviewing the business records of the ombudsman's office, what have you discovered with regard to how the sale was conducted? It wasn't conducted according to the statutes. Objection, City of City, Your Honor. Let me just sustain that. As a lay witness, saying it's not something that's an ultimate conclusion in the case, which is, has to be before the trier of facts that the court has to sustain. Just that if, I, if I can, Your Honor. The, the business records of the ombudsman would be an exception to the hearsay rule, Your Honor, so that would not be hearsay. So if she's reviewed them, I think she could speak to what those records provide. There's two problems with that, right? One, they have to be exhibits in the case, even separate and apart from that. The ultimate conclusion about whether something did or did not comply with the statute is the ultimate conclusion in the case for this court to determine. I understand that, Your Honor. And so the court has to sustain the objection because the lay witness can't do the ultimate conclusion of the case. She has her opinion on it, I understand, Your Honor. It's right. To the extent it's, in the viewpoint, there was something wrong, it's different than it was, did not comply with the statute. So the court has to sustain the way the answer was phrased. The court cannot take into account answer the way the answer was phrased. Thank you so much. I, I apologize. I was, not, I was not understanding how to say that. Let me ask this. Ms. Tobin, do you have an opinion as to whether or not the sale was conducted in accordance with the statute? Statutes. Right. And I, I realize now by that objection why, how I'm saying it wrong. But my question now is, is, do you have an opinion as to whether or not the foreclosure sale was conducted in accordance with the, the required statutes? Yes. And what is your opinion? It was not. And what do you base that on? Because I, I know now the statutes and I know that what they're, the, that they're supposed to be notice given to the ombudsman of the sale. And there never was notice of the actual sale given to the ombudsman. Not just that there wasn't a deed, but there was no notice of the sale. And the records that the ombudsman keeps, that I review for a number of properties, is showing that, that the only notice that was ever published according to, um, well, to, through the Nevada uh, Legal News three times, the only time that happened was with the notice of sale that I got from February 12th of 14. Objection, Your Honor, that's your state. I got that notice. Courts only taking into account the non-self hearsay portions of the witness's statement. Yes, Your Honor. How did you find out that the property had sold at foreclosure sale? I um, sent an email to Craig Leidy um, when I had gotten back from California. Uh, 
and I, um, I said, the, sa the offer that's on the table, you know, what's happening, and I got a notice from the HOA about the dead trees, and um, what are we, what are we going to do? And he called me the afternoon of um, the August 15th, which was the day of the sale, and he says it was sold this morning. Have you had, have you, have you reviewed the foreclosure deed in this matter? Yes. In your opinion, was the foreclosure deed accurate? It, it relied on a um, rescinded notice of default. What do you mean by that? Notice of default that was dated March 12th of 13 was rescinded on April 3rd and recorded on April 3rd. Was there a subsequent notice of default after the one that was rescinded? Yes. Was that referenced in the foreclosure deed? No. <coughs> you mentioned, I believe, um, uh, briefly having a, a contract for sale with uh, some folks called the Sparkmans. Do you recall talking about that? Okay, that was the first of um, four escrows that never received lender approval. It escrow opened on August 8th of 12 and it, um, the, their money was given back to them. The request for their money back was August, uh, excuse me, April 4th of 13. Besides the Spartans, how many other either office, offers to purchase or purchase contracts regarding the, the, the property? There were a, a lot of offers, but there were three escrows open on sales that I signed that were contingent on lender approval, um, that lender approval was never given. So Can you describe those three escrows for the court? Yes. Um, May 10th of 13, the Maidsoz, M-A-D-D-E-O, uh, made a $395,000 $395, uh, purchase offer. And um, it, it didn't close. Um, the bank didn't approve them. And uh, okay, that was that one. Then on March 4th of 2014, Red Rock Investments made a $340,000 cash offer and escrow was open on that one. And then on April 18th of 14, um, the Nation Stars set, told the um, um, me that they had to, uh, well, they told Lighting, he told me I had to sign, to do a market validation program, which meant that the $340,000 uh, offer escrow would be put in advance by Nation Star, and um, the uh, listing agent, Lighting, would be required to put the market, put the property on the market on auction.com and sell it for um, best price, I guess, by an open bid. So then that on May 8th of 14, that high bidder at the auction, I signed and accepted that contract for $350,000 plus $17,500 of um, buyer's premium. So escrow was opened on, that was MCK property, um, and it was pending lender approval.
which was never granted. Based upon, were there any other uh, escrows open for the property? Uh, those were the only escrows. I did have two other offers after this last one that, well, Nation Star, well, not, Nation Star said the investor required that it be relisted. Based upon the escrows that you entered into and the offers to purchase the property, did you form an opinion as to the value of the property at or about the time of the foreclosure sale? Yes. The, I had a $358,800 offer made on August 4th in hand. So that would be one thing that would, I would say made its value. And the um, foreclosure deed statement of value put $353,529 as of August 22nd as the fair market value, or well as the real property transfer tax value. The judge has to hear on that. Of course, I'll give us the non-hearsay portion and take into account the non-hearsay portion of the response. Ms. Tib Ms. Tobin, who, do you know who, who purchased the property at foreclosure sale? I know of that. I know what the deed is. I know what uh, um, that Craig Lighty told me, Tom Lucas. But what, is that what you mean? That, let me ask you a question. Uh, have, have you reviewed the Sun City Anthem ownership records? Yes. Does Mr. Lucas show up as an owner of the property in the Sun City Anthem ownership records? No. Judge, I your city owner. That's her own personal knowledge. No, it's not. It's based, she just testified it's based on the review of the Sun City Anthem records. It's true. We're just going to overrule it because it's only as to whether it appears or doesn't appear, not as to what the impact of it appearing or not appearing is. An impact, the court has to disregard hearsay. Whether it appears or doesn't appear, the court can take into account. So granted in part, overruled in part. As a Sun City Anthem homeowner, are you aware of any procedures that are required for the board to approve a foreclosure process? I am aware of what, what the Sun City Anthem's standard operating procedures. I know that in order to do anything, the board meets and they, they have a motion, a second, and a vote, and they record the vote, and, and um, everything is, has, um, is done according to Robert's Rule of Order and according to the requirements of the code. Have you reviewed um, the Sun City Anthem minutes of the board meetings regarding the foreclosure of the Hanson Trust property? There is no record anywhere in any of the Sun City Anthem records of anything to do with it. Same with this. going to sustain the objection as to the ultimate conclusion, but we'll take into account what this witness stated she viewed or didn't view. Understood, John. Ms. Tobin, we've, we've discussed a, a number of uh, failings regarding notice and miscalculation of amounts due. Um, did 
did we touch on all the irregularities of the foreclosure sale? Um, I, I had no idea that the foreclosure sale was going to happen. And I got no notice that it did happen. I, because I'm, I, I'm, I've never done this um, type uh, testifying before, and so I'm very cautious about the way I'm phrasing things seems to be causing a problem. But as far as what was irregular, I know from a great deal of study now what's irregular. But at the time, I didn't know it happened. I didn't know it could happen. I, I didn't know. I just, I, I. My issue at the time was the nation. Nation Star didn't own the note, and that was the reason that none of these were, these these escrows were closing. And so I was concerned about them getting the excess proceeds. That's all I had, Your Honor. Okay. Cross examination by contract defendants counsel? No, Your Honor. Okay, for being no cross examination, then this witness is excused. Thank you so very much. <coughs> okay. Okay, then at this juncture, I'm planning to that would have exhausted because that's the only trust is a party, correct? On behalf of counterclaimant, is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. So then I, so do you rest on behalf of counterclaimant? We do, Your Honor. Okay, so it's counterclaimant rest. I now go to counter defendant. Counter defendant, do you have any of your client representatives that you wish to place for testimony? So, what does counter defendant wish? Are you resting or are you making a motion? What are you doing? Well, wish, I mean, motion. we're just resting. Since it's a bench trial, we could make a motion for directive verdict, but we might. I mean, it's really the court's preference. Court has no preference. I'm just asking then, then you go to you as counter defendant. You have an opportunity to put any of your clients on the no. caption. You choose not to, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Since okay. so you choose not to, then do you rest and then I move back to rebuttal we'll case? Back. We'll it, well, right. I think I, so right. then I technically move back to rebuttal case, but is there nothing to rebut, Your Honor. Okay, there being nothing to rebut, then it would be the time for closing arguments. Do the parties wish to engage in closing arguments? Some parties do, some parties don't. Sometimes people say they provide the proposed findings. Yeah. It's up to you all. If you want closing arguments, it would then be counterclaimants closing argument. Your Honor, I think everything is contained in the proposed findings of fact that we have set forth. The reasoning, I could, I could, I would be, I would be restating that, and that would not be productive. That's why if we can, we can rest on this, Your Honor. Okay. So you're waiving closing. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, it's a question. I mean, you're more than welcome no, no, to close no, if you want. Okay, so then I go to counter defendant. Do you wish to do a closing argument? No, Your Honor. Okay, so neither do you wish to do a rebuttal closing argument, counter claimant? No, Your Honor, just knowing that this, just to be clear, we're adopting our proposed findings as I think our closing, Your Honor. Is that the same thing that defense, counter defendant is doing? To the extent I should be looking at those both? Yes. Okay. So is there anything else from either party or the parties in light of the fact I just got uh, the findings just now? The court was inclined not to do a ruling from the bench. The court was inclined to read through the, well, I've read both of them because I already have gotten counter claims. I already got counter defendants. Um, so I had an opportunity to read them late last night. So at this juncture, rather than ruling from the bench, the court's going to find it more appropriate that I do a written order. So that means both parties' needs, which is probably going to be a couple weeks. That's you can appreciate it. I'm in trial and I'm balancing. I'm in another trial other than your bench trial. I'm also doing a jury trial, as you know, this afternoon. Um, so put it on Chamber's calendar. A few being my youth in this term. Um, June 21 sounding appropriate. Sure. But on June 21, if I can get to it beforehand, I'll do so. Okay? Thank you, Your Honor.
Do we need to appear on June 21? No, no. June 21, what, my goal is on June 21. Goal, aspirational, may have to be continued, is to basically have incorporated things into a court order with findings of fact and conclusions of law as a result of the conclusion of the bench trial. If, I, if the court thinks that it needs additional time, then you'll get a minute order that's saying that the court's continuing at a week or so to a chamber's count or no appearances necessary. Does that meet the party's needs? Sure. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I do appreciate it. Thank you all for your time. <coughs> this juncture, the trial is concluded. And the court will issue a ruling um, aspirationally June 21. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Honor.